interactive communication today will be part of what I depend on. Um, let's start with the question. What is scaffolding? What's it for, Dave? Uh, it's a, I'm calling it uh, an interlocking uh, a locking of uh, something that you stand on to get to higher places. Barry? Exoskeleton. Ooh. Exoskeleton. For the purpose of? Support. Of people who? Oh, wow. You guys just cut 10 minutes off my sermon. <laughs> Scaffolding. <laughs> An exos... Oh, wait a minute. I just figured out what you meant. <laughs> um, an exoskeleton to lift people up above the earth to maintain and care for something. Framework. What is a framework or framework? Think of something that uses framework. <laughs> oh, okay. The common components that make the software run as a whole has a framework that those common components run in, and that is the basic framework of the software. Then there are the pieces that do specific jobs. You know, uh, Diane, it's interesting that you would say that because people don't think of computer software as having a framework. But if you map it out on paper, it is so structured that the first time you see it, you look at that and go, wow, that's impressive. What else uses framework? Or, oh, is that what you were thinking, Nancy? No, we're buildings. Homes or houses, buildings. The Chrysler building back east, steel framework, bricks and sandstone and mortar, houses, wood framing. What does the framing of a house do? It's the, the basis of the foundation. Interior support. Interior support. And what you're talking about is the framework of the house holds the ceiling up so that you have rooms to use. What else does the framework do? Does it hold the windows and doors? Yeah. If there's no framework, what happens to the roof? It wouldn't, wouldn't be there at all. Well, they'd build it and it'd still be on the subflooring and nobody could squeeze in there for breakfast. Now, framing, framework, holds the doors and the windows, the plumbing, the electrical, the switches, the lights, the framework. What good is a house without framework? Well, maybe for fireplace wood, that's about it. So when we think of scaffolding and framework, what are we talking about? Structure? Are we talking about design? Are we talking about engineering? All of those, All of those things. So what is our framework in our life? What is our framework in our lives? I'm... No, and Nancy points out so elegantly, you're not talking about personal physical stuff, no. Barry says schedules. Schedules are part of our framework in life. What else is part of our framework in life? Jesus is the foundation. Uh oh, man, there goes another seven minutes of my sermon. Jesus is the foundation of our framework of our life. Is the Bible is not only part of the framework, 
but it is part of the instructions for making the framework do its job at the highest level. Now, when we as people think of being Christian, what happens? Let's, let's take an example that's out there a ways. What happens when we take framework that is of a human, a person's life, an individual, and we take that framework and we stuff it on top of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and we put the individual's framework on the Trinity? Are there any risks? Tell me the risk that is probably the most substantial. It may not fit. Could we say that a different way and say it might be wrong? It might miss the intended purpose? I had an experience a couple of days ago. I went to the grocery store and it was going to be one of those evenings where everybody sat around and hung out and visited and ate chips and watched a movie or something. And I said, okay, I'll go to the store and I'll get some snacks. Well, I was headed down the aisle to go to the sour cream cooler. And there's a family in the middle of the aisle. And I can't go around them because mom and dad and the little one take up the whole aisle. I said, excuse me, may I get through, please? And they didn't even acknowledge me. Now, if I would have gone one or two aisles to the left, the store in its redesign has a department there and you can't get through without going two more aisles down. And if I would have gone to the right, they were unloading pallets of food into the freezer cases. So I said, pardon me, uh, excuse the interruption. And I turned sideways and I started going between the little boy and the cooler. And right when I got in front of him, he kicked me in the shin of my left leg right down by the ankle as hard as he could twice. And all of a sudden I found myself saying something, I won't repeat, I will tell you that it was a very human reaction and response to that event. Now, I see the look in the parents' faces and I realize they want this to turn into a war. They want this to turn into an argument and to turn into something so significant that it attracts attention. No apology for the kid or nothing. And all of a sudden I hear, shut up. And I'm thinking, okay, that's probably followed by move on peacefully. So I went down the aisle and got my stuff. Well, in the end, it turns out that I had reacted based upon my gut reaction, my experience, my life. I reacted out of habit, and I put my framework on that situation. My belief that I had the right to say what I said was put on those people. And I suddenly realized I just forced this whole situation into a whole nother level because I put my belief about me and what I had the right to say and do on them. Now, what would have been the simplest way to cope with that situation and confound the people, the parents, and the child wouldn't have got it, but what was probably the very best thing one could have done 
to let the parents know that I was aware of what they were doing or not doing. To say nothing and say excuse me and move on quietly. They wanted the war and I wouldn't give it to them. And I acknowledged their being there and I went down the aisle and got my stuff and left. Now I did talk to the store manager and some other things happened about it. But it became necessary for me to struggle with keeping my mouth shut and realize that saying nothing robbed them of the power they sought to put in place. In other words, the coals heaped upon them was non-reaction after I said what I said. Now in that, do you think each one of us might have the same exact response or maybe a different one? Let's say it had happened to Dave. Okay, well, I, my thought was, I think I would probably evaded the whole thing and gone way around so I could, I'm from the other end of it. And, uh, so you're saying put it in reverse, back up, change direction, go down a couple of rows, and then go all the way around. Yeah. Okay? Right. Avoid the issue completely yeah. by not becoming part of its starting. Okay. Valid. Diane? But that was a test. <laughs> you can't avoid tests. <laughs> Diane points out that was a test. A test. Okay, so Diane says that in this, putting oneself behind you, which means that if, if your attitudes and your desires are behind you, what is in you in that moment? It should be Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now, I had absolute peace as soon as I got by that young kid and headed down the aisle. And I was shocked by the fact that I had peace. And in that peace, I found myself forgetting about what had happened. Now, every time I started to ponder on it, I got angry again. Now, the whole point of the story is that I learned not to put my framework on other people. Now, when we say framework spiritually, could we be talking about something as simple as our belief system, our belief uh, list of statements of what we believe? Is that a framework for part of our Christian life? Well, sure it is. How important is it that we don't pick up our framework and go plop right on Barry and then hold her in container within that. What can happen if we do that to someone? Better yet, what can't happen? To put our framework on someone else? Yes, our belief framework. The things we believe in that we believe are of God. What happens when we put ours on someone else? Pardon? They'll reject it. Ooh, they'll reject it. Or at least uh, have a negative attitude. Okay. Unless they happen to agree. Unless they happen to agree. Now, Nancy just went to the heart of the conversation here. 
Ephesians 4 talks about people. Some were made. Notice the word M-A-D-E. Made, intended, built for. Being a pastor, an apostle, a preacher, whatever. And what's the purpose in them being made to do one of those jobs? Building up the body so that the body comes to what? The full and complete measure of who? Jesus Christ. So each person in their specific makeup, as God has put it, is there to do a job to help people attain a full and complete measure of Jesus Christ. And they're there so that in becoming a full and complete measure, they can relate to other people. They can teach, they can share, so that what doesn't happen? They are not swayed by every wind of new doctrine or every change. Swayed away from what? The truth, the understanding. So, if we're looking at living with other people, and we're looking at how people are made, and what they do, I go back many years to my teenage years, and I remember a time in the church when every woman who had been a mother went to this one young new mother and every woman gave their opinion about mothering and they didn't say well I think you should consider this what they said is well what you're doing is wrong you need to do this and then the next person came and said well what you're doing is wrong you need to do that what do you suppose happened to the heart of that young mom confusion. oh mass confusion Resistance, yes. I that when I became a mother, but I had it in another instance of my life. And it's like, please give up. It's like, just thank you. So we could all be, uh, we could all learn together. But I <laughs> so Nancy points out that she had her experience in a different area of her life. But we could learn to point things out and communicate better. Now, where should we start when it comes to understanding the framework that we should have. Diane has pointed out that we should let ourselves go so we are behind ourselves and that Christ should be what is in us in the moment. I want to point out something that is significant here. We're going to go to Proverbs for this. But tell me, what is a proverb? Advice. Advice. Wow, Nancy, I love that. Thank you for saying that. Because advice isn't dogma. And it's also not a passing whimsical statement. It is word for the use and the benefit of someone. Yes. Yeah, there's no you might consider or I would suggest. So it says follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. And we're going to talk about what that instruction is in just a minute here. But in being who we are in today's world where people seek to start cultural wars, race wars, they seek to be noticed. Some want to take anarchy to the streets. There are others who don't want anything. They just want to be away from it all. As we go into the world in the workplace, the framework that we live by and that we live under and we live through, and it lives through us, is Jesus. Consider Proverbs 3. 
My son, don't forget my teaching, but keep my commandments in your heart, for they belong, will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. So what did the commandments become when Christ was born and grew up and after he died? What did the Ten Commandments become that fosters and supports the Ten? Love God with all your mind and heart and body and soul, and the other one is like it, love your fellow man. So, don't forget, my son, what I taught you. Keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Why heart? Why heart? Keep my commandments in your heart. That live, by them. live by them. Diane? The, heart's the, core of our being. the heart is the core of our being. Not just medically and physically, but in the sense of a metaphor, the truth of the heart is where we're taught David, the king, lived. He lived in the truth of his heart. There he loved God with everything he had. In Proverbs 3, verse 3, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Boy, that's a direct reference to Jesus, if I ever heard one. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. There we go again. If it's in our heart, what, it, what yeah, Nancy. It's like where you really believe it. Where you really believe it. You live it when it's in your heart. Did King David fall back on his heart very often when he did terrible things, when things went wrong? Sometimes his heart was good and sometimes it wasn't. But in the end, the one thing we see that he believed was in God and in God's love, his sanctity, his deity, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them in the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. So what is that talking about? It sounds to me that that sentence, then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. It sounds like it's talking about ethical behavior, moral behavior. To be seen good by men and seen good by God suggests that it is a heart change, not just what I think, but what I believe in. So, if we're looking at living in this world, living as brothers and sisters of Christ in church, if we're looking at how we get along with others, if we put our framework on others, do you suppose we would do that because we believe it's appropriate, it works for me, it should work for them? Might that be part of the attitude? Possibly. Do you suppose it means, well, I don't like and agree with what they're doing, so I'm going to tell them what I think about it. What does Jesus teach us? One of the big lessons is don't compare yourselves one to another. Don't go there. And then in Proverbs 3, we get the answer. Why shouldn't we put our framework on other people? Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Who is him? Jesus. And God, the Holy Spirit. And he will make your paths straight. Now, if your path's not straight, what happens in that metaphor? You come to a mountain and you can't see what? 
can't see around it. We can't see the future. We can't see what's over there where we should go if we should go. And so if our path is made straight, the mountain is off to the side and we can still see where God wants us to be. So we have this, this very distinct matter of problems being removed. Don't lean on what we know and believe. Don't lean on the things of our habits. Don't lean on the things of our experiences. Don't lean on our own understanding. I'm looking for something specific here. Bear with me a minute while I find it. There it is. If you look at Proverbs chapter 3, and you put it in plain old basic English, if Curtis were here to tell us what Proverbs 3 is about, his words would be, don't assume you know it all. Proverbs 3 is saying just that. Good friend, don't forget all I've taught you. Take to heart my commands. They'll help you live a long, long time. A long life live full and well. Don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and the eyes of people. Boy, if that there was something that was meddling, that would be it. I'm reading Proverbs 3 from the Message Bible. Tie them around your neck, love and loyalty. Carve their initials in your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and the eyes of the people. Verse 5. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. In other words, the most inner places of our being. It should be part of our soul and part of our makeup, spiritual DNA, if you will. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Well, if we're not figuring it out on our own, who are we figuring it out with? Jesus. So what does that mean we have to be doing? Constantly turning to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, and to what? The Word. The Word. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. Thank God at the store, I heard... And I heard clearly and obeyed. That would have been a terrible situation had I reacted the way my gut wanted to. And the way my head wanted to. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God and run from evil. Don't walk. Don't uh, stroll. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health where you, let me try this again. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Now, when it comes to somebody that has that happen, I think of my dear sister Diane because that's the way she talks and lives. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. That metaphor is profound when it comes to giving us a sense of what it's like to run to God and run from evil. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. Don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. 
If the child he loves that God corrects, a father's delight is behind all of this. So if we now understand, don't put our framework on someone else, who is the framework? What is the framework we should be putting on everything? Jesus. Jesus. You know, Ephesians 4 goes on to say, so that you're not swayed by every wind of change and every new doctrine and every this and every that. It comes to point out that there is always deception, always lies, always mistruths, always people with false motives. And if we're going to stay clear of that, we got to know when to turn and run to God and when to run away from evil. Today, the words are about this. Don't let our beliefs, our thoughts, become something we force upon someone else when it comes to behavior, when it comes to belief. You know, one of the things that fascinates me is that you can have the argument about the disciples. The argument is this. Were the disciples all saved? And we don't know what happened after he died. Do you think when he stood before God or will stand before God, he's going to say, oh, crap, that was a wrong thing to do. I, Nancy, thank you. I would imagine he might be saying, I don't know why I did that. But didn't he, because he killed himself, he felt remorse. He really, did he repent? Did he repent of selling Jesus out? But he couldn't accept the forgiveness, and that's why he killed himself. So, he felt the remorse at such a deep level that he killed himself. Do you think that remorse was guilt? Yeah, I did. He knew he was wrong and he could not live with the weight of it. And so Jesus, loving him anyway, no matter what, Judas put what on himself? His own framework, not Christ's. And we have to wait to ask Jesus, what happened? After this, tell me, show me what happened. I want to see how you work that out. Now, when we consider it, when an unbeliever is rebellious and doesn't want to fall in line and doesn't want to live what the word says, is there a point at which we should cast them aside and move on without them? Okay, now right now we. I would say, I would say yes. Let them, let them uh, suffer their own decisions. Okay. God will still have them. God will still have them. We still love them, but we can't allow them to get us into discord. You know, affect us. Okay, now explain to me then how Thomas did not believe in Christ and His deity. And Thomas was a disciple. Jesus believed for him. Believed on his behalf. And we see the result. Come here, my brother. Here. Give me your hand. Right here. Now you know. And all of a sudden, here's Jesus' framework cast on Thomas. And we see the result. It is very important, not for us, for others, that we don't put our personal human framework on other people. Maybe not even our God framework on them. I mean, you know, there's the examples to um, shake off your feet when you leave that town, but if they don't accept you, Jesus didn't change everybody when he was here. Yeah. Don't cast your pearls before swine. I mean, you know, you give it your... 
if the people don't accept the framework that you think you should give them or even God's framework? So tell me, who lives in the most precarious, dangerous place when it comes to framework of men and the framework of God? Teachers and pastors, specifically Pastor Bill and I. I find myself awake at night from time to time wrestling with one word that was put in a sentence that day because of a personal motive. We need to, in conversation, just in everyday life, saying something to someone because it came from my head not my heart of Jesus. And so as we go forward, we need to be loving each other to the point where we're able to tolerate when someone's framework is dropped on us and be able to, in a godly manner and in a Holy Spirit-like manner, deal with that and take care of that and be a blessing and not take it personally. You see, Jesus didn't take Peter and what he was going to do personally. He didn't take Judas and his choice personally, nor Thomas's. And I find it so encouraging that Thomas, who was an unbeliever at that time, but stayed for something. Suddenly, the master himself says, I'm going to show you and you're going to believe because I showed you. We have to be willing to be in the game, totally committed, until Jesus shows us. Who might have presented?